How's it going, guys? Welcome to another Basic Expert video. I'm the Basic Expert, John, and uh, I had already recorded this video two other times, and I just wasn't happy with it. And I wanted to get back to sort of discussing, or I wanted to, I really wanted to make this video, but I just felt like every version of it that I made, um, I wasn't enjoying. I didn't like. And so, with this video, what, what, what it's about is Dungeons & Dragons, original Dungeons & Dragons from 1974. And it was kind of me thinking about um, how would I apply the rules from Chainmail and original Dungeons & Dragons if all I had access to was the white box and the Chainmail rules. And so I kind of wanted to, to discuss that a little bit and, and um, you know, just kind of talk about my view on it. I, I might get some things wrong. I might say the way that I would apply these rules is different than the way you did in 1974. That's okay because other people did the same thing too. Uh, you can't sit and pretend like there's one true way to play original Dungeons & Dragons because while the rules are complete in as much as you're given tools to run a fantasy uh, campaign, it is not like modern rule books we have today. I would liken original Dungeons & Dragons to like, you bought a model kit of a tank. You you, you wanted to build a, a Sherman World War II tank. And original Dungeons & Dragons is like, Here's all the parts, but actually some parts are missing and the directions are really bad and you just have to go off the picture on the box. Whereas more modern games, even modern OSR games that are clones of original Dungeons and Dragons, fill in those missing gaps and give you, they kind of rewrite the instructions in a way that make it more clear and, and concise as to what is trying to be attempted. But because of that, it's just that author's, that the author of the clone's interpretation of those rules. And so what I want to get back to, what I want to look at in this video in particular is character creation and um, how, how it worked. Um, I, want, I want to look at these, these things and how, how this all would work and play out. So without further ado, let's look in the rule book. I have the PDF up. I don't, I'm, too, I'm too poor to get a, an original copy. That's, that's not happening. Um, Let's let's look in these and uh, let's let's see what these original rules are saying and uh, talk about them. So let's go. All right, we're here in the PDF for original Dungeons and Dragons, and um, I want to go over to see the scope. Um, I, th there's just a couple of things I want to point out that are interesting. So uh, I think Bennett Questing Beast and the Bro Asar have pointed this out too, but I just love. I think it's interesting how. So is this at least one referee, at least one, so you could have multiple referees, multiple DMs, and from 4 to 50 players can be handled in any single campaign, any single game world, but the referee to player ratio should be about 1 to 20 or thereabouts. I think this right here goes to show this, this war gaming roots, the, the kind of thing that they are running. Obviously not all 20 players are going to be at the table at the same time, but you know, um, if you're having multiple DMs, and uh, you're going to run a game, let's say, every every Friday. Every Friday night is game night. Whoever can be there, you can play. And, and here's the thing. The rules of original Dungeons & Dragons are so simple. And the game is kind of so deadly that I could see having a party of 10, like 10 people showing up to your house to play the game and the game not getting bogged down because the rules are so simple. It's so rules light that... I could see 10, 12 players sitting around a table playing Dungeons and & Dragons and, and not worried about waiting for their turn quite as badly as, say, what often will occur in 5th edition. I remember I ran a 4th edition game for 12 people once because I was a psychopath and I thought I could do it. Uh, this was back during the 4th edition days. And uh, that, that game did not go well. So, But I could see, I could see 12 people around the table with original Dungeons & Dragons. I could I could see that that happening, especially if you kind of run the game in the Dave Arneson way, which is, uh, from what I understand, the way Dave Arneson ran it was sometimes players didn't even have access to their character sheets, and we'll we'll see some rules here that I think kind of hint at how much control over the game the the referee had, but the the players were just told like, you know, you're going to be a fighter, you're going to you can choose from a fighter, a cleric, or whatever. They didn't even know their their ability scores. They would just say, I want to attack the orc, and Dave Arneson would roll the dice for them, 
and adjudicate everything and just tell them what happened. And so it was very much just this dialogue game of what is going on and behind the screen. They didn't know what was happening. They didn't know the roles that were going on. And uh, to me, that's just a fascinating gateway to run the game. I would have, I would be interested to play, and I don't know if I'd want to run a game that way. Um, Dave Arneson is apparently a very good uh, dungeon master, one of the best, obviously, co-creator of this whole game and this hobby. But uh, I, I would be totally in, down to, to playing in a game that would do that. That just sounds super interesting to me. Where you're, you would totally be immersed in the game because you're just telling the DM what you're doing, and then he's telling you uh, what what's happening. So. Uh, I just find that that part to be to be kind of interesting here. So uh, let's let's keep going. Let's keep looking at the rules here. So another aspect that I think a lot of newbies, new players will kind of miss, and I think a lot of new gamers would look at this and kind of scoff at, is that there's only three classes: you have fighting man, magic users, and clerics. And then you you have um you you have Dwarves, which can be fighters, you have elves, which can kind of choose where they want experience points to go into, and this is where hit points will get interesting, and I want to sort of talk about different ways people handle this. I kind of want to look at, at elves, so let's, you have halflings too, whatever, and humans are not even listed because just being a human was like the default, it's, it's the rules are implied setting thing where most characters are going to be human, but uh, elves can begin as either fighting men or magic users and freely switch class whenever they choose um, choose from adventure to adventure, but not during the course of a single game. So the way I see that is at level 1, um, I would assume you'd roll hit points for whichever would be beneficial, so I guess that's the benefit of being an elf. You're going to roll your hit, hit die for fighter or magic user, maybe take the most beneficial, or pick the fighter maybe, because generally the fighter is going to be a more beneficial hit point total and um you're going to uh just just do it that way and we'll get to hit, hit points and hit die in a little bit because from what i've learned talking to various people is that there was different ways of of doing the hit dice and of, of the gaining of hit points and how it worked and groups seem to have in the 70s prior to supplement uh, one which kind of changed the game to be more of what we would understand it to be today uh, those people, um, more, they, there was lots of varying ways of, of, of rolling hit die. I'll, I'll just say. So thus they gain the benefits of both classes and may use both weaponry and spells. They may use magic armor and can still act as magic users. However, they may not progress beyond fourth level fighting man hero, nor eighth level magic user warlock. Elves are more able to note secret and hidden doors. Doesn't say how I love it. They also gain the advantage noted in the chainmail rules when fighting uh, certain fantastic creatures. And in chainmail, that's I think uh, where we get the the thing that um, the elves are are not affected by the paralysis attack of of undead like ghouls and stuff like that, which became more explicitly laid out in like BX and AD and D and whatnot in later editions of the game. Uh, finally, elves are able to speak the languages of orcs, hobgoblins and gnolls in addition to their own elvish and other usual tongues. So uh, let's scroll down a little further here. Um, well, actually, before we get to that, let's go to determination of abilities. Someone on one of my videos in the in the Shadow Dark uh, review that we did uh, with Vic and Poncho Goblin, someone talked about, uh, oh, 3d6 down the line is um, a misinterpretation of the of the writing here and to a degree that commenter was right but i don't see any other way of interpreting it and i'll, I'll explain why so uh let's look at determination of abilities prior to the character selection by players it is necessary for the referee to roll all three to roll three six-sided dice in order to rate so that they're saying there's no comma there three six-sided dice in order comma to rate each as their various abilities comma like it, it doesn't have that, so it's saying in order to rate, like you're gonna roll 3d6 to get some scores, and thus uh, aid them in selecting a roll. Categories are uh, of abilities are strength, intelligence, wisdom, constitution, dexterity, and charisma. Each player notes his appropriate scores, obtains a similar roll of three dice to determine the number of gold pieces. So I'm assuming that the ref is rolling for how much gold you have as well. Uh, so 3d6 times 10. He starts with and then opts for a roll. 
a sample of the record of a character appears like this. Um, and so reading, you have to read the context here. This supposes the this supposed player would have progressed faster as a cleric, but because of a personal preference for magic, opted for opted for that class. So it, to me, when I'm reading this text and trying to get it in in conjunction with with what Gygax I think is trying to say here, uh, the referee is rolling for your ability scores for your your ability scores for strength, and what I what I get from that is that the, he's rolling the the referee is rolling three d six and telling the player. Rolling, rolling the dice. Your strength score is fifteen. Rolling again. Your intelligence score is ten. Rolling again. Wisdom is twelve. Rolling again. Your constitution is seventeen. Good job. Uh, rolling again. Oh, your dexterity six. Uh, rolling again. Your charisma is ten. Like that's that's what I, I I'm getting. So the 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 players are getting a set of scores, and then they get to pick what class they want to be based on the scores the referee gave them. So. The the way this is saying here, the the suppose this supposed player would have progressed faster as a cleric, but uh, because of personal preference for magic, opted uh, opted for that class. So they picked a magic user, even though that they would have been with the attributes in this order with these scores, would have been a better um, cleric than a magic user. If you could put scores wherever you want, I see that this player would have put those scores. Uh, in an order to make their magic user better, but they didn't do that. This this paragraph here very much implies that the referee is calling out your rolling the dice, calling out your rolls, your what your score is, and you are getting that score. So yes, it doesn't. This is a mis. This is mis. There is a misinterpretation here of three six set of dice in order to rate each of the various abilities. Sure, it doesn't say three d six down the line, but the way that I read this here, and maybe I'm an idiot, I don't know, but the way I read this here, it is the referee rolling 3d6 for every attribute and telling you what they are, and then you have to decide, based on the scores that you're given by the dungeon master, what class you're going to be. I think modern players would freak out about this uh, mode of play. I think it's kind of cool, and I would have total trust in my... In, in the people I game with, that if someone, if we were to play this way, and it was, you know, laid out from the start, this is what it's going to be, I, I think it'd be fun, and i probably play a kind of character that I normally otherwise wouldn't want to play, and I think this kind of shows how early on, like, min-maxing and this uh, munchkin stuff was was not as important as it has become, and I think a lot of modern games, uh, especially as rules have become a lot lots more crunchy, um and here's here's the thing too when you look at these scores here uh you might scoff at this like oh 3d6 i don't even get to do 46 drop the lowest the 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 scores the the spread the math for original dungeons and dragons is really tight in that like dexterity um you're going to average around 11 i think that's the peak of the of the pyramid of the of the bell curve for 3d6 is 11. so at, at worst you're not going to get any bonus for um uh, a dexterity score below uh, below below nine so from nine to twelve no bonus to missile fire above 12 which is entirely possible you're going to get a plus one to hit and below nine you're going to get a minus one and so it's. I feel these rules and the the spread of a, how small the bonuses are, which I really like. I like that tight math of being very stingy with plus ones and minus ones. Um, it 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 makes it feel like to me that these characters are actually a little mo bit more viable than you would otherwise guess with the ability scores they get and the hit point totals they get. It's still a deadly game at level one, sure, but um. You're not, you're not quite as gimped with average scores or slightly below average scores as you would maybe otherwise be in, in say, fifth edition or even in BX, which has a spread of plus three to minus three. So, uh, I mean, look at Constitution here too. Where is it at here? Uh, you have a Constitution of fifteen or more. Uh, you're going to get a plus one to each hit die, and if you have a Constitution of of six or less, you're going to have a minus one to each hit die. 
So, you know, the ch you're not going to get punished for having a seven constitution. You're just going to roll your straight hit die. I think that's that's quite fair, in my opinion, um, just to put things in perspective for people. So if we look at that, I wanted what I wanted to look back is go back to hit points. Oh, one little fun thing is you don't have flint in in this. So in original Dungeons and Dragons, you don't have a real way of starting fire, <laughs> which is funny. Um, we got our. I, I love that uh, original Dungeons and Dragons uses the uh, titles here. Victor and uh, Crossface did a video just last night, a, a stream talking about level one fighters being veterans, and I, I thought I'll have it up here in the, the video so that you guys can watch that one. I think it was a really good conversation they had last night. Uh, but let's look at the hit tie here. So this is where, and we'll end the video here talking about this part, because it just fascinates me. You have these hit die, and every hit die here is a d6, for those that don't know. Um, they're looking at this, and this doesn't make much sense to them. So at level one, a fighter is going to roll a d6, and he's going to add one to the roll, which makes sense because a fighter should have more hit points, but a lot of characters, even when they are fighters, aren't going to have a high enough constitution to get any bonus. So you got to give the fighters a bonus here. And then the rules is written, um, if you have a higher constitution, it might be 1d6 plus 2 for your starting hit points, max hit points of 8. Uh... So I, I kind of wonder if that's where the 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 D eight comes from, maybe in in BX. I don't know that that math that adds up to the the maximum hit points there. At level two, you're going to roll two hit die, but this is where it gets interesting. Like you could interpret this as uh, you're gonna you you are rolling um, you are rolling an extra hit die on top of the the previous one. You're rolling an extra so you whatever you roll let's say i i'm a level one fighter i don't have any bonuses i roll i rolled a six it's good so i'm going to start with seven hit points and then on the, the, as i level up i roll again i rolled a two so i'm going to have uh, nine hit points and then i roll another one again another two that's going to be 11 hit points i get to level four uh i, I rolled a four so that's 15 hit points but then we get to swashbuckler here and uh, that's going to be five plus one. You could interpret it easily as I'm going to roll um, a hit die and uh, take uh, uh, two, three. So uh, that's going to be, so what was that, 15? It's going to be 18 hit points. I don't remember what I said previously. But you could have it like what we kind of understand is consecutively. But to me, if that's how hit die works, it's a little weird as to how elves switch back and forth. I'm not quite sure how an elf switch back, back goes back and forth between these two. Um, would an elf, I guess you could homebrew an elf, takes the most beneficial of any thing. So like the, the fighter has some more beneficial hit die, cumulative hit die, um, but the ma then the magic user does, so you could give him those. One way I've heard that some groups did this is maybe and it's probably obviously a misunderstanding of the rules but i was told that in my research that some groups would re-roll their hit points every session so you'd go to a game and you had different hit point totals every game so you know you'd roll at, at swashbuckler you would roll five plus one let's say and you know you're rolling your five and, and one day you have 10 hit points the next day you have like the max the next session you have max I don't like that, um, but I could see how that misinterpretation, and I, I think it is a misinterpretation, uh, could come about. Another way I've heard it done, and I kind of like this, because you, you could use this method actually for um, making a very gritty game, I think, low lower hit point total game. And it, to me, it makes kind of more sense as to what uh, how, how the elf magic user uh, advancement would work. Because the issue I have is if you if you are doing this, uh, it is a cumulative hits, but it it if you're doing it that way, how do you the balance? Let me just explain it, I guess. So let's say I'm an elf. I'm gonna roll for the fighter hit points, uh, one plus one, so two. That's probably more than if I rolled as a magic user, I'd get five. So this is the way I would do it. The, the the elf gets to pick to have two hit points or five. They're gonna pick five. 
but every other character also does their hit points in this way. The the magic user puts um, points into their, their the elf puts points into their magic user a prof profession. So they go from medium to seer. So they level up. They get to roll one d six plus one. Uh, they rolled a two. That's not more than five. So I would let it be like, well, you leveled up, but you don't have to take that hit point total. You can keep your five. Cool. They get more spells. Uh, they they still get to swing a sword and wear armor because they're an elf. And uh, so you know now they now they have uh, two spells instead of one. They still get to sw swing a sword and wear armor. They're still pretty powerful. They're at five hit points. Um, for a fighter, let's say you're just playing a straight fighter, and I roll. And I roll a three, so I have three hit points. The fighter would, when he levels up, roll two, and that is eight. So I would take that. But let's say uh, at level one I rolled six, and at level two I rolled five. I didn't do as good of a, a roll. Six hit points is higher than five. I'd be the same thing. You don't have to take the five hit points. You can keep your fighter at six. Uh, so this could lead to a much more gritty... Um, a deadly game maybe but i've also heard that that's this is how some groups did their hit points as well is that they would it, they were re-rolling for the total every time they leveled up and sometimes that meant a hit point increase if the roll was higher and like you're going to start trending higher and higher as you go up here um or or you could do it the the, the way that we kind of all know where it's like this is you're going to roll one one plus one you're going to roll an extra hit die an extra hit die um, extra hit die. So it just comes down to interpretation, I guess, on how you want to handle elves, in my opinion. Because um, the elves are not clear. I, I remember I asked uh, Likely Arrow on my Gilded server as I was doing research and trying to understand how to play original Dungeons and Dragons. And I'm like, so how does elf multiclassing work? And he was kind of like, that's the perennial question. That's one thing that everyone has argued about on the internet for a long time is how do how does elven in original dungeons and dragons how does elven multiclassing work and the answer is nobody's super quite clear there's a lot of ways that it could go and original dungeons and dragons is one of those games that is uh so vague that like i don't i don't know what the right answer exactly would be and it makes sense to me why Gary Gygax, for instance, wanted to make um, uh, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons or came out with the basic sets and whatnot to get people into the game because obviously these rules were kind of incomplete and the game was starting to evolve into something that was even beyond what they originally thought this was going to be. You know, they thought you were still going to be using this with chainmail. And, you know, that's what that's what this thing is here. Fighting man capability, fighting capability. This is what it would be. Uh, equivalent the character would be equivalent to in the chainmail tables so um yeah i don't know and the final thing that again i find interesting i want to just touch on real quick before ending this video is there's only three classes i really like that there's not even a thief here and to me this kind of plays up to that idea that like a fighter or magic user um you know i was talking to uh griff from Secrets of Blackmore. We had interviewed him about Secrets of Blackmore and the Lost Dungeon of Tonisborg, and uh, he has a whole section in the Lost Dungeon of Tonisborg about using thieves in your party or not, because these original rules didn't have a thief. And he he was saying how, um, you know, in most adventures, like they weren't trying to pick locks. Like you were forcing a door open, because um, that's another thing. Doors do not open for player characters in a dungeon it's assumed that every door that a player comes across has to be forced open but a door will open for monsters it's like this magical weird thing where you know a door will open for monsters but it won't open for players and once a door is opened it's assumed that the door will close on its own and get stuck again for players and not be stuck for monsters it's super weird another weird thing you know is that i love is uh uh Monsters in original Dungeons and Dragons have uh, uh, infravision. They can see in the dark, essentially. But if you were to charm a goblin, let's say, who is able to see in the dark, it instantly loses infravision once it becomes um, on your side. So there's a lot of weird little things like this that are little quirky things that 
you may like or not like. I find it all just super fascinating as this these roots of the game and um, the hobby, really, and and uh, how people played the game back in 1974, because this is the first, you know. Uh, I talked about Traveler, which classic Traveler is a more complete game than I think than original Dungeons and Dragons, and um, it's definitely more concise and less and more clear than what uh, OD and D is in a lot of respects. And came out in '77. This is '74, so three years later, you know, Traveler's out, and there'd been games. You know, this game spawned a lot of of different um, clones even back in the day. But uh, this is the first, and it's super interesting to see where it came from. And I'd love to know in the comments from you old grognards, how did you guys handle hit dice? Did you just do them accumulatively, like kind of what we understand them to be today, where, you know, I'm rolling one plus one, and then I'm rolling an extra one and adding it to my previous roll. I'm rolling an extra one, adding it to the previous roll, extra one, adding it to the previous roll, five plus one, and adding it to the previous roll. Did you do it that way, or did you do it... Um, roll if it's if re-roll and if it's higher take it if not don't take it uh i'd love to to know what uh um what you guys how you guys did it back in the day uh if you like this kind of content talking about old school games and just their weird quirkiness and how fun they are in my opinion to me the 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 vagaries of original dungeons and dragons are a feature and not a bug and i love that so if you love that kind of stuff too please like subscribe share if you want to support the channel you can find me on subscribe star or my gilded server or support right here on youtube and uh thank you guys for watching i'll catch you guys on the next video peace out